Hey everyone, um, I'm Alex Conrad. I'm the venture capital editor at Forbes. I also write about enterprise software when it's not boring me to death. With us, we have um, one of the top VCs in New York City. You probably already know him, um, Eric Hippo of Lear Hippo. Um, Eric, do you mind telling those who don't know in the room uh, just kind of what stage your firm is operating in and sort of what the focus is? Well, we, we are seed first investors, so that our first investment is typically in the seed round. But we have two funds. We have a seed fund uh, that will cover seed and the Series A. And then we have a follow on fund called the Select Fund that will pick up the investments, our pro rider rights, when it comes to the B and the C, and sometimes the D round. And we also do some direct Series A. So we're kind of, you know, all stages, but the first investment is typically in the seed round. So you're based in New York, but um, I know from my own coverage that a lot of the interesting companies these days could be anywhere in the country. Are, do you guys think about yourselves as a New York-focused firm from an investment side, or, or how do you think about geography? Yeah, well, when we started Lara Hippo uh, about nine years ago, we decided to stop uh, traveling for work. Um, I had received my American Airlines four million mile card, and I thought, well, that's kind of ridiculous. I don't want to spend the rest of my life doing that. But it, but it was also because it was my observation and other people's observation that, that, uh, that you have to be part of the community in order to make the best investments. You, it's really hard to parachute into a region or another city and then, and then you know, make the best investments because the local people will make the best investments. So New York, um, New York is now uh, by far the second largest center of innovation in the country. Um, it's an in, in incredibly rich, incredibly diversified uh, city. And, and also, as you know, uh, tech workers today want to live in dense urban areas. They want that experience. They want that lifestyle. The reason why Amazon uh, decides to build part of its new headquarters here in New York. Uh, Google has 10,000 employees. I mean, everyone is coming to New York uh, because uh, of all the major cities in the United States, what better city than New York City? So you've been investing here for a long time. Um, I've been covering the New York scene for almost a decade now. I feel like I hear some of the same things year after year after year in terms of where our ecosystem is going. And I'm curious, if you were to sort of look from when you started investing to now, is New York ahead of schedule? Have we grown kind of as you would have anticipated? Or where would you put us on sort of the journey to be a more mature ecosystem? Well, I, I don't know if we had expectations about certain goals in terms of growth. Uh, what, we, what, you know, what we wanted to make sure is that we had our uh, fingers pretty much in every groups of people developing interesting technology. So we have companies that go all the way from robotics to consumer products. We, we have the probably the, the largest portfolio of direct-to-consumer brands. But by the same token, we, we, about half our portfolio is enterprise, enterprise software, marketplaces, uh, AI, as, as, as you can imagine, a little bit of blockchain. Um, but I mentioned robotics. You wouldn't expect robotics to be, um, to be uh, a, a place, or New York to be a place for robotics. But there is a, there is a, a really dense community, uh, mostly came, coming from the 3D printer world. Um, so. You, you see pretty much everything in New York. What you don't see, you don't see storage, you don't see, we're not, we're not gonna replumb the internet here in New York. Okay. Do you think that um, we as, as a community, whether it's the reporters, the investors, do we still kind of stereotype cities with certain markets? For example, a media business, you probably wanna be in LA or New York and a, you know, let's say a uh, healthcare business, you might want to be in Philly or Boston, but you know, probably not LA, or how do you think about that? Well, it, it's, it's, I mean, clearly some cities have a, a background and a specialty, but, but I don't think you should see it this way. The two biggest media companies, of course, they, they, they won't talk about themselves this way, but the two biggest media companies ever created are Facebook and Google, and, and they're in Silicon Valley. Um, so what, the benefit of New York is that because of the size and because of New York uh, economic history, you, you pretty much see every, every segment of the economy being represented in New York. And people come up with uh, fantastic ideas on how to disrupt those sectors. So, uh, so uh, healthcare is a good example. We, we don't do biotech because that's not a, a, nectar, a sector that we understand, but we do digital health. And uh, there's a lot of activity going on in digital health here in New York. Okay. Um, 
and when you think about sort of what is uh, the front line for, for you and your peers, is, is your firm trying to differentiate by having different theses or reaching the entrepreneurs in a different way? Or what, what's giving you a competitive advantage when it seems like there's a lot of capital in the market there uh, for, for at least the top entrepreneurs to choose from? I would say that our biggest advantage is that, first of all, we all have an, uh, an operating background. So we all understand that it takes a village, if not a city, to, to build a company. And it's really, really, really hard. Um, so we have built. Uh, a community that is supported by a, a, a platform that we've developed where people are plugged into our platform. There's a number of services uh, on that platform. Uh, we have in-house recruiting. We offer you know, all kinds of events. We offer a kind of a continuing education program, if you'd like, although it's not termed that way. Um, and then more importantly, the, the community itself is constantly actively supporting each other and supporting themselves. Uh, we view our, our initial role as taking a company that is uh, about to go to market or just in market, that's a seed level company, uh, to, uh, and, and you, typically companies like that will raise about 18 months worth of runway, so they, it takes them about a year to establish the, kind of the kinds of metrics that they need to raise a proper Series A, and then it takes four months before they run out of money to raise a Series A. So the, the time is compressed, um, and so all of our efforts are, are geared towards making sure that they have a story and the metrics to back it so that they can go uh, and, and be in front of the top tier VCs to raise a Series A. And about two thirds of our companies manage to raise a Series A. So we view that as, 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 as a focus uh, and, and a level of success. The data that uh, we at least have seen at Forbes suggests that there are more concentrated deals happening where the average Series A deal now is, is a lot larger than it was. The average seed deal today is larger than the average Series A deal a few years ago. Does that change how entrepreneurs are reaching you or how you're having to evaluate them when, let's say, at least some of your competitors are trying to throw a lot of money into one you know, potential winner? Yeah, I, I think the data makes it sound a little bit more dramatic than it might be, and maybe it's geared towards or, or oriented more towards the later stage where you are seeing massive rounds now, kind of a $100 million round is not unusual uh, in today's environment. But, but where we operate, at the, let's say at the seed level, our, our current round, a typical current round is about two and a half to $3 million. Um, it used to be maybe one and a half to two, maybe five years ago. So yes, it has increased. Uh, but it, it's not, you know, a dramatic. The West Coast is different. Um, you know, they, they live in their own kind of bubble uh, out there, and they see they, they don't see anything wrong in doing a seed round of you know five six million dollars at you know fifteen to twenty million pre. That that's not where we operate. We think that that's a um, that that's a um, not improper, but it's it's a very risky proposition because you're starting a company at a really high level in terms of its value, and you can, you can only go up from there. As you well know, any down round or even a flat round, but let's say a down round, will severely impact the life of the company. So you know, we always encourage our entrepreneurs to think through the entire uh, uh, funding cycle so that if uh, in their field it, it would take 50, 70 million dollars to break even over a period of time, then we encourage them to think backwards to, to, to today to make sure that the, the amount of money they raise plus the valuation uh, will allow them to continue to step up. I think that's a great point, um, the, the thinking backwards. I, I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs um, that we meet with don't do that. You know, They kind of just expect that if you execute successfully today, the rest will fall into place tomorrow and the day after. And then the next thing you know, you're out of runway and you're kind of raising or trying to reach that next stage in a scramble or sort of a panic, right? And it, it seems to me that, um, I don't know, you can tell me, but VCs are gonna be less likely to invest in you if they sense desperation, right? Well, absolutely. If, if, if there's any sense that you're, you're hitting a wall, um, and it, like I said, it might hit, it, you might then end up with a down round. A down round is a very, very, it's like uh, cutting off a limb. You know, you're basically saying to your former or to your current investors, you know, sorry, what, what you've done for us means nothing 
uh, we're going to cram you down. And that's, that's, a really shock, that's a shock to the system. But I would say also, the other thing to, to keep an eye on is, is are the exit valuations. And despite the fact that we are, you know, we've got these multi-billion dollar companies and some of them have exited uh, in, in multi-billions of dollars, nevertheless, the average exit of a VC-backed company today continues to be, the sweet spot continues to be between kind of 50 and $100 million. So it's a far cry from that and expecting your company to exit at you know, multiple billions of dollars, which is really, really rare. Um, so you've got to keep that in mind. You know, not to say that you should be thinking that your exit will be $100 million. You should be thinking much higher. But, um, but you know, if you do end up exiting at 80 or 100, then what does that mean in terms of the capital you've raised and the return that, that people expect uh, from that capital? One place where a $100 million exit is not a good thing, I think, would be SoftBank. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of the people in the audience um, have seen the research about SoftBank. I, I feel like it's become a cottage industry just to kind of keep track of where the Vision Fund will go next. Um, obviously, they're throwing around multi-hill, $100 million checks at times. Um, is that affecting your business? Do you guys kind of watch what they're doing because it, it's the same game as you, or are they basically playing a different sport at this point? Well, it, it affects us in a good way, uh, in the sense that um, hopefully, um, you know, a, a high tide will uh, rise all boats. Um, and therefore, if in fact they're right about where the world is going, meaning that the world is being overtaken by technology, therefore, uh, technology companies, particularly the ones that have a lot of data behind them, uh, will end up being valued at a super, super valuation, whatever it may mean. If that's true, uh, then you know, most of our companies or most of our good companies will rise up in valuation as well. Um, you know, the reality might be a little different than that, but I, I was a partner uh, at SoftBank for many years. Uh, I, I, I worked with Master closely for many years. Uh, he's not someone that you want to underestimate. Uh, he, um, he is truly a visionary. Uh, he's truly brilliant. Um, he, he had one of the very best VC investment uh, ever in the history of venture capital, which is his, his you know, $40 million or so investment in Alibaba that turned into $85 billion. Uh, so, uh, so, you, you, so he will find in that search of his where he plunks, like you said, hundreds of millions of dollars here and there, there will be jewels uh, in, in that portfolio, and I'm sure that uh, it will work well. However, having said that, to manage $100 billion as a, as a venture fund as opposed to a private equity fund uh, is, has never been done before, and um, so we'll, we'll all be watching you know, and, and, and seeing. Hopefully, he'll be successful. Is there any concern that you can basically just buy your way to market leadership where, um, you know, one tactic I've heard uh, some of these giant funds using is basically going to an entrepreneur and saying, you know, take our $400 billion or whatever it might be, and they, the entrepreneur says, I don't want that much money, and they say, okay, well, then we'll just give it to your closest competitor. And the entrepreneur is kind of in a tough spot there. Um, is that, do you think that tactic works, and, and is that a concern when maybe you've backed the company turning down that money? I, I'm skeptical that that works. Um, I, it works at the later stages where, where you have a company that has clear product market fit uh, that you know, if they have a couple hundred million dollars, whatever the, the, the number is, to f deploy fast and, and scale fast, I think they might have a chance. But even, even having said that, it hasn't really worked in the case of Uber. Uh, Uber has basically given up most of, uh, most of Asia, uh, and even in the United States, um, it could be that Lyft might be a, a better economic proposition than Uber, but we'll have to see. You know, they might even go public first. So this idea that, um, that everything is going to be like Google, where it's kind of the winner takes all, I I'm skeptical about that, that thesis. And I'm particularly skeptical about it in the earlier stages. And we have seen, we, we've, we've seen situations where our companies have had to compete with companies that are funded you know, well beyond the stage. And, um, and when we speak to our entrepreneurs, they say, well, you know, if I had another $100 million, you know, we, we just raised 5 to 10, let's say, whatever the, the amount is. If I had another 100, I, I would 
park it in the bank. There's no way that I can, with money, kind of plow through all of the development and all of the testing and all of the piloting that I need to make in order to make sure that my product reaches its market. So you, 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 can't, you can't leapfrog that process. And I'm, I think that those companies that, that don't pay attention to the amount of money but just kind of do what they need to do will be the ones that end up being successful. Are they, uh, in part, do you think some companies raising so much money because they don't want to have to reach an exit? You know, when I, when I first started watching this space, um, it seemed like what I was taught was that the traditional outcome for a successful startup was an IPO. You raise the money, you grow fast, you go public, you become an adult company. It seems like it's a much more complicated uh, track today. And I don't know if an IPO even is the sort of preferred outcome for, for companies. So, so what are you seeing with that question of an exit? Well, I, I, I think that VCs, particularly my colleagues on the West Coast, um, they've stopped doing that. But there was a period of time that maybe ended maybe two, three years ago where they would say to their companies, hey, I'm, I've got a pile of money. I'm just I'm going to keep it in reserve. I'm going to give it to you. You don't have to worry about an exit. You don't have to worry about an IPO. And I think that that's a mistake. I think that that um, entrepreneurs need to have, particularly entrepreneurs that take money from venture capitalists, you know, we're called capitalists for a reason, <laughs> right? I mean, we, uh, we expect a, uh, a risk-adjusted return of, on our capital that is really high. We have high expectations, and the entrepreneurs who take our money, you know, we're, we're good people, we're friendly, we help them, et cetera, but at the, at the end of the day, we have to return our money to our own limited partners. So I, I think it, it, the, the, the the, the idea that an IPO is a bad thing, I think that is completely irrational. Unfortunately, the trend is, is you know, there's about half the number of public list, publicly listed companies today than there were in the 1970s, and the, the trend is going down. I don't know what's going to replace it. There is no private market that replaces it. And I can tell you from my own experience that when you have a company that reaches a certain valuation, call it multiples of hundreds of millions of dollars, it is really, really difficult to find a buyer. There are very few buyers who are capable of making a billion dollar acquisition or who want to make a billion dollar acquisition. So, so as a result, companies now are staying private longer. Mm -hmm. um, there's this whole thing going on with secondaries and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. How do you reward your early employees who are totally vested? How do you reward your early investors who have been there for 10 years uh, when they expected to be there for maybe five to seven years? So something's got to give. And I think that the, uh, the best thing that can happen is, is, a, is an IPO. You, you get a currency that you can trade with. You can reward your employees. Uh, you have a true market benchmark, because the market will determine what your real value is. Um, and you have a lot of flexibility. And in, in return, you have to be responsible, and you have to be, um, you know, you have to make quarterly reports. And what's bad about that? I mean, it's discipline. I don't see anything wrong with it. Do you think there's a, um, an area of innovation, whether it's a uh, type of product or a uh, sort of one of your groups like robotics or something where, where most of your peers are overly negative or just overlooking a space and it's one that you would like to see more attention? Well, they, they, the, 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 the space, and this is, this is actually a real issue for, in my mind for our society, which is the, the areas where we don't see innovation are the areas that are highly regulated, and I would say number one is government, and number two is education. And actually, let me reverse that. Education first, government second. Um, our educational system, we don't have time to talk about it, uh, is, um, is bankrupt. We don't teach. In New York City, we have 1.2 million kids in our public school system, and there is no regular program to teach them computing and coding. Um, and yet, we can, we as uh, entrepreneurs, uh, backing entrepreneurs, we can't innovate in that area because it's all c completely, you know, under wraps. And this, you know, so that needs to be opened up, and and, and for sure, government uh, needs to be reformed with technology. Is that something where the tech community or the investment community can light a fire and drive change, or is that something that needs to be done by, let's say, you know, the school systems or the government before you guys can really move in? Yeah, the, the, we, you can't move in without government and the school system, and in the school system, in particular, the unions, 
who are you know, very retrograde, to say the least, um, if they don't understand that uh, it's their future that's at stake, uh, then there's very little you can do because they block everything. Well, I'll give your email address to uh, my union member uh, teacher yeah. sister. Sure. After this. And my email, my email uh, box will be flooded by uh, <laughs> negative um, uh, troll-like messages. I understand. Well, uh, you know, <laughs> I think everyone agrees there's a problem. Not everyone maybe agrees how to start solving it. But anyway, um, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Eric, for all uh, these insights. My, my pleasure. <laughs>